Okay, hello everybody. Welcome to a, another interview from the from the members of the Sam Salmon. Um, we have two very special guests with us today. My name is Brian Dormeyer. I'm a seventh grade English teacher at Shaler Area Middle School, and I'm the advisor for the Sam Salmon. And I have Andrew, Izzy, and Nick here to help um, with an interview with two very good authors. And we're going to be talking about the Twilight Zone. Um, first, we have Miss Ann Serling. Um, she's the author of As I Knew Him, my dad, Rod Serling. Uh, we have some questions for her and her father's influence as far as the Twilight Zone goes. And we have another expert on the show with us here today, uh, Mr. Mark Dwidziak. He wrote Everything I Know I Learned in the Twilight Zone, as well as several other novels I'm now interested in, a novel on uh, Dracula, for example, that's going to look really good on my bookshelf. Um, so thank you so much for joining us today, Ms. Serling and Mr. Dewidziak. Thanks, Thanks for having for us. Having us. Mm -hmm. Izzy had the first question to kick us off. Izzy, do you want to start, please? Sure. What about the Twilight Zone allowed it to become a timeless piece of American culture? Can, I'm sorry, can you repeat that? Yeah. What about the Twilight Zone allowed it to become a timeless piece of American culture? Well, you know, a lot of people have addressed that, and I think it's because my dad dealt with the, uh, the human issue, you know, things that we're still dealing with today, racism, mob mentality, uh, isolation, uh, loneliness, and these are all timeless things. Um, and I've said this before, uh, times change, but people really don't. And Mr. Dewisiak, you can weigh in on any of these questions as well. What do you think? Why is the t the Twilight Zone so timeless? Well, I, I think it, it dovetails into what Anne just said. Is if you, you study Rod Serling's life and his work, his themes don't change. He's always passionately interested in the same things. The only difference with the Twilight Zone was he took him into metaphoric or allegorical storytelling. He, he took he, what he did was he was having a lot of trouble getting his message across on television in the late 50s. So he decided he took a gamble and it was a great gamble. The gamble was if I uh, couch this all in fantasy, I can explore the same themes I've been exploring all along. And fantasy is just this marvelous way of telling stories. It's a great way how we tell stories to each other. Um, parables are, are, st are storytelling. Uh, Aesop's fables, storytelling, the way we sort of t get the moral across. Um, fantasy is wonderful for that. And you get people to listen who might not have listened otherwise. You, you, you get the, the, the people all of a sudden who might that if you preach at them, you know, like Mark Twain once said about humor, that humor must not obviously and professedly preach or teach, but it must do both if it's going to live. And I think the same is true of fantasy. And I think that's one of the marvelous things about The Twilight Zone is um, Rod Serling is one of those writers who always seems like he's talking about today, even though he was writing in, in, the, in, a, in an era that never knew smartphones, never knew an internet, never knew DVDs or, 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 any, or streaming or any of that. And if you look at those those shows, they're they're little black and white shows shot with old fashioned fashions and everything, and yet the messages are right on, right on target for for today. And I think they're always going to be. I think the Twilight Zone, you know, if you listen to the introduction of the Twilight Zone or one of the introductions of the Twilight Zone, at one point you'll hear Rod Serling say that it is as vast as space and as timeless as infinity. Turns out he was right. It is. Absolutely. We talk a lot about the human experience in my seventh grade ELA class, and Nick had a question about humanity. Uh, yeah. Um, I was wondering, what does the Twilight Zone say about humanity? That's a, that's a great question. And I, I recently read something. Uh, Buck Houghton was the old producer of the Twilight Zone. And he told his son once that uh, my dad had seen horrible things in the war. And Buck wondered if perhaps my dad turned to writing 
uh, to regain his affection for humanity because he had seen such horrific things. And he, he felt that it was important to talk about what really matters and um, what really counts at the end of the day. And I, I think what it says about humanity is there's a lot of dreadful things out there and with, within us as people. But I, but I also think my father was a very hopeful person that we had the capacity to change, but we must face it head on before, before we can, we must acknowledge it before we can change it. No, I, I, and I would agree with that too. Uh, you know, the, I think the great thing about the Twilight Zone, Nick, is that um, it, it, it celebrates the best of us and it condemns the worst of us. If you watch a Twilight Zone episode, it might be celebrating uh, one person's contribution to humanity. It might be a, an episode like Night of the Meek that uh, finds hope in the most hopeless of situations. And it might be an episode that goes right to the the black heart of the worst things that Rod Serling noticed in us, you know, and, and probably the worst of it was prejudice and bigotry. Um, you know, I, I and, I, and I'm going to go to a different writer actually, because I, 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 I hadn't thought of it. It's a good question, man. I hadn't even thought about this until right now, but uh, a few years ago, I interviewed Anne Rice, uh, the author of uh, interview with the vampire. And we got to talking, and, and if you notice in her books, Anne Rice, she truly celebrates the uh, the achievements of the 20th century. And I once said to her during an interview, yeah, but the 20th century gave us the Holocaust. And she said, and it gave us the response to the Holocaust. Yeah. And I thought that was a wonderful answer. And I think that's, you know, something uh, in, in what Anne was just saying about her dad was that he saw the worst of it in World War II and he became part of the response to it. He became one of the most eloquent voices in responding to all of that, that the, the awful things that he saw during the war. So I think it's both. Uh, that, I, the, the great thing about the Twilight Zone, again, because it is as vast as space is that it encompasses almost like the works of Shakespeare, it encompasses all of humanity. And that means, you know, there are things about us that are, are really wonder. We're, we're smart little monkeys. And there's stuff about us that are, that are endlessly admirable. And there's stuff about us that is just, you know, in Mark Twain's words, sometimes leave you wishing that Noah and the family had missed the boat. So, I mean, there's, there's a little bit of both, you know, in there. Thank you. Yeah, Andrew had a question about an episode of The Twilight Zone. Yeah, my question to both of you would be, if you were introducing the series to someone who had never seen it, which episodes would you recommend and why? Like Mr. Dwidziak like, brought us to the Night of the Meek episode, which is a very important episode of the series. So what are some other episodes that you would have to recommend to other people to get started? Well, I would say Death's Head Revisited. Um, about the SS officer who goes back for fond memories of uh, the Nazi camp. I think it's a really important episode. And one of the few that my dad said, uh, the, you know, his closing uh, nar narration was, it must be remembered in the Twilight Zone or something. But with that episode, he said, wherever we walk the earth, it needs to be remembered. Um, one of my personal favorites and my dad's was walking distance because as my dad told the writing class, he had an affinity to talk about the past. And I think we all have that a little bit. You guys are still pretty young, but I think you'll get there where, you know, you, you want to revisit these old haunts and old memories. And, um, um, but there, there's a two that I'm thinking of right off the bat. Thank you. I, I would I would start with the monsters are doing Maple Street, yeah, of and and I, I one of the reasons I started the monsters doing Maple Street because, uh, you know, as I say in the book, I don't know that there is an episode which is more relevant or resonant than that episode. A lot of Twilight Zone episodes were extraordinarily resonant at the time they were written, um, but a lot of them have grown, uh, even though you know, you know Rod Serling could not have. Uh, envisioned where the world w would go. And yet, Monsters Are Doing Maple Street somewhat 
takes uh, conditions which existed in the 1950s. And uh, these are elements which have gotten worse in our, in our city. The fact that we are more divided now, we are more suspicious of each other, we are more divided than ever before. And Monsters Do in Maple Street really looks at the, the price we you pay when you give in to those fears and those suspicions uh, of each other. So I, I definitely would start with the Monsters Do in Maple Street. I love The Obsolete Man. The Obsolete Man is one of my, because it, it also speaks to the dangers of a totalitarian uh, government and not prizing the individual and not prizing the written word. Um, and I, I think, you know, the, the worth of the individual is something which runs through all of Rod Serling's work. And so um, I, I, those two would probably be leading candidates of mine. But I would also hasten to warn all of you, uh, my answer probably will change tomorrow. It's like when somebody says, what's your favorite Twilight Zone episode? I always say, it depends on the day you ask me. You know, I, I'm glad you brought up Monsters because I just wanted to mention there's a, a program in Binghamton, New York, where my dad was from called The Fifth Dimension, where all the fifth graders study about the Twilight Zone and they learn all of these, um, you know, all about racism and mob mentality and all the things we were talking about before. And one of the teachers showed the episode, The Monsters Are Due on Maple Street. And she asked the class, who are the monsters? And she said the entire class stood up. Miss mm. Serling, that is the story the entire seventh grade reads at Shaler Middle School. And, and it's coming in the coming weeks here, we're going to be looking at it. And we talk about suspicion and scapegoating and mob mentality. And we ask that exact question of our students. So I expect Nick, Andrew, and Izzy to jump out of their seats when that question is asked. <laughs> Great answers, thank you. Um, Andrew, let's move on to your next question. And I think we sort of hinted at this when um, Ms. Sterling talked about her father's experiences in the war, but will you ask that next question there that's um, about why? That's the question I think most people talk Okay, so yeah, I had a very question, like a very interesting question to me about did your father ever tell you why he wrote these stories? Um, not at the time. I was really young when when Twilight Zone came out and um, I think it I was four. And I knew that my dad was a writer, but I didn't know exactly what he was writing until I was about seven. And that was because some new kid on the playground asked me one day if I was something out of the Twilight Zone. And I had no idea what that meant. So I went home and I asked my dad and he explained that he wrote for a series that it was probably a little bit too old for me. Um, but, I, you know, as an adult and after writing my book, I, I understand, you know, uh, why my dad was writing these things. It, it, again, circles back to what we've all been talking about. Does that answer your question? Ask me your question again, maybe, if I have an answer. Oh, definitely. That makes a lot of sense, because if you were too young to really understand what was happening with it, then I don't know how you would know. Because Twilight Zone, it's, very, it's a very good series, but for some people, it probably is still maybe too scary for like really little kids. So I could understand that, but it's nice to just know that people will do stuff because they need it. And okay, I, I don't know how to phrase this, but you know, I'm glad to hear that you would learn how, why he was writing this, which is mainly just what I wanted to know. Okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll weigh in on that a little bit because you know, you know, Andrew, th th that's kind of one of the, the when you study writers, that's one of the great mysteries of why they write, you know, and a lot of it is almost like a forensics uh, investigation. You, 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 you study their life, you study their writing, and you kind of try to figure out uh, where it came from. Um, and it's one of the great eternal questions, you know, I, but I, I, I do think that one of the things is that as a profession, uh, writing chooses you, you don't choose it. Somewhere along the line, writing sneaks up on you, grabs you by the throat and drags you down a dark alley and says, you're a writer. Uh, you know, it's it's one of those things which, you know, it, it, you know, there, there are people who actually, you know, set out to be writers and, you know, sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. But really, it, it's one of those things which and, you know, in Rod Serling's case is a very good example. When he comes back from the war, 
it's not like he gets out of the high school saying, I want to be a writer. It's not like he got out of World War II saying, I want to be a writer. He discovers it. Writing chooses him uh, when he's in college, when, when he's at Antioch College. And it, all of a sudden, it becomes this, this way of working through his war experiences and, and, and also being able to say the things that are probably bottled up within you. You know, if you know, if, if, for, for a lot of us who to choose writing, um, you know, Eugene O'Neill once famously said, I don't take vacations because I'm a writer. I can always go anywhere I want to right here. And I think, you know, so in, in, in this in the sense, we can we can answer that question, but we can never answer that question because it's going to always be a f endlessly wonderful, fabulous. It's what it's what makes the study of writers so fascinating. Mm -hmm. And to what Mark just said, my dad was actually, uh, when he got out of the war, he wanted to work with kids. He wanted to teach phys ed to kids. Uh, but then he realized, you know, that he was still so traumatized that he switched his major to language and literature. Because as he said, he had to, he had to get it off his gut. He had to get it out of his system. Thank you. Izzy, do you want to ask Miss Serling about when she was younger? Yeah, how was your life um, impacted growing up from the fame of the show? Well, you know, again, I knew my dad was a writer, but a lot of um, my friends' fathers were also writers. And it wasn't like it is today with the paparazzi and the insanity that we see today. So our lives were really pretty normal. Um, and we were very shielded from the whole Hollywood scene. Uh, I, we were very aware when we went out with my father and people would uh, often want his autograph. But, and my dad was also always very gracious. He, he was very honored that people respected what he did and uh, would always sign an autograph. But again, not, it wasn't like it is today. I don't, I don't know how people deal with the insanity that, it, that we see today. Nick, ask your question. Put them both on the spot, please. Nice and loud. Ask, ask the question you had. Um, if you were to um, make your own Twilight Zone episode, um, I was sort of wondering what time frame you would set it in. And... Um, what would occur throughout the episode? That's a really good question, Nicholas. Well, again, uh, as I said, I, I have a propensity to deal with the past too. So I think I would write my very own walking distance and go back and find my father. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I suppose the answer should be that I would write an episode where the world is better and we're not dealing with all the horrific things we're dealing with today. So maybe that would be part of that episode too. And I know Mark is gonna have a superb answer. To <laughs> That's right, put me on the spot. Um, well, you know, no, it's something I think about a lot because I, I do write fiction and um, and I'm actually do think, I'm thinking about a, um, a story right now uh, which which would be actually set because if you had asked me, and then this is a good Nick, I, I I can't impress upon you enough. You can ask writers all day long. You know, what's your next book? What are you working on? What do you would you work on? They're almost always wrong. You're almost always wrong when you when you it's it you know the universe kind of decides for you what you're going to do and pushes you in certain directions. I I have been wrong almost every single time, but I am working on sort of a a, a fantasy historical novel right now, which is actually addressing a lot of the issues of today, the divisions in in in, in our world, but set in the the in New York City in the 1800s. So, you know, I, I've got a direct answer for you because I am actually doing that right now, mm -hmm. uh, that, that kind of a story, or attempting to do that kind of a story right now. Uh, because, and, and, I, and I guess one of the reasons is that um, if you set it today and, you, and you, you talk about today, people are going to be less likely to listen. They're just going to be a lot less likely to, to hear what you have to say. But if you sort of say to people, you know what, we have always been dealing with these issues. 
look, here are, you know, when, when we were a nation of immigrants and we were a nation of every day new immigrants showing up, we were dealing with all of these divisions back then where people looked at newcomers with mistrust and we had to get through it. Um, there's nothing new. It, it, and I always say this is, you know, if you read about politicians during ancient Rome, this time or read about politicians uh in the in the the fifteen hundreds they act exactly like the politicians of today they they're no the animal doesn't change they're exactly the same their motivations are the same their actions are the same the only thing that changes is what they're wearing you know it, and and so it, you know and that's again that's kind of the magic of the Twilight Zone is you can either go forward like Star Trek did and go into the future and and address things uh you know one of the great episodes of the original star trek um that a lot of people go to that addressed prejudice was about two people from the same planet and they are black and white split right down the middle half of them black half of them white and they hate each other and everybody looks and says why you're you're exactly the same they said no we're not He's white on the right side, and I'm right on the uh, white on the left side. We're completely different, and it's this wonderful metaphor for prejudice. And but he sets that in the future. He sets that the Star Trek goes into the future. So sometimes staying right in your present is it's hard to get tough to people to listen. And I think that's one of the lessons of the Twilight Zone is there there are ways to trick people into getting to know, listen to what you're talking about. Humor and, you know, fantasy are too great. And when I say fantasy, I don't just mean, you know, fantasy is a big tent. Mm -hmm. Fantasy includes science fiction. It includes what we think of as fantasy, like the, the Harry Potter uh, books and things like that. And it also includes horror. So it includes that all three of those genres, actually. So we say fantasy, but we're really talking about a very, and the Twilight Zone embraced all three of those, by the way. These kids are learning about ancient Rome in, in uh, Mr. Bacco and Miss Welka's class this year. So that probably resonated with them. And, and we are a political with the salmon, but I talk about the same thing you said with, with them. It, things don't change as far as politics go, except for what they're wearing. That was a, a good way of putting it. Um, I'm glad to see Daniel joined us. Daniel, you can ask your question in just a bit once you get caught up to speed. Um, I had one question I want to sneak in before I let the kids ask another question, just because it makes sense to ask it now. Why do you think horror and fantasy and science fiction is such an effective way of addressing all the social issues we've talked about? Well, when my dad did The Twilight Zone, and I think Mark um, addressed this at the start, was um, he was having, he really wanted to talk about these very important issues for instance, wanted to tell the story of Emmett Till. Mm -hmm. And there was so much censorship back then, um, he couldn't. Uh, and he, he once said that an alien could say what a Democrat or a Republican couldn't. Mm -hmm. um, no, yeah, and, and, and I, I have always found that, that um, you know, one of the great things about, uh, fantasy and horror and science fiction is um, they're always about big themes. They're, they're, they're always ad addressing the, the big things. I, I, I think that's particularly true about horror. You know, f science fiction tends to be about the future and the future is either going to look very bleak or very optimistic in science fiction. But, you know, I think horror really gets to the heart of, uh, of the human condition. And I think the reason for that is that uh, I think the two forms that do that the, the best and, and, and the quickest are humor and horror. And, and, and those are twins. Humor and horror are flip sides of the same coin. They both address um, things we are comfortable talking about, things we don't like to talk about. They give us a means of addressing things. They give us a means of, put, of wrapping our minds around very, very difficult subjects. And, and, and horror particularly really looks at the big, big themes, you know, and, and I've got to stress that, you know, I mean, cause this case kind of come up, you know, I started watching the twilight zone when I was about 10 years old. Um, I was not old enough to see it in its original run, but it was rerun. I grew up in New York and it was rerun all the time when I was growing up. So I, I watched it constantly, but I watched it 
on the level of just being kind of a, a, a what we now call a monster kid, which was a our term now. We didn't have that term back then, but it's a yeah. term for a horror fan. And uh, I watched it because it was a wonderfully creepy show. I watched it for that great moment where the hairs on the, the back of your neck would stand up and that, that sort of creep out moment. And that's the only level I enjoyed it on. But I really enjoyed it. You know, now it wasn't until I was about your age that I started watching it and certain way, you know, there's something else going on here. These monsters or these aliens or these, they all represent something. They all stand for something. And, you know, with fantasy, your first question is always, what is it about? What is it about? You know, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, what is it about? You know, is it about a scientist who, 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 who swallows a drink and this monster comes out and he can't control? Well, no, that's plot. That's not what it's about. What was Robert Louis Stevenson really, really writing about? Was he writing about drug addiction and alcohol? Was he writing about the battle between good and evil in every person? Was he writing about man's response to God? I, I didn't create me. You created me. Why am I to blame for the way I am? What was it Stevenson was writing about? And the answer is, we don't know. Because he never told us, thank goodness. So the only person who gets to decide is you. You watch these wonderful stories on the Twilight Zone. And you, you know... The book I wrote about everything I need to know, I learned in the Twilight Zone. Those are the lessons I derived from the Twilight Zone. It's not necessarily the lessons you'll derive from the Twilight Zone. Everybody has a different response to this. And that's, I think, one of the reasons. So that's a long answer to your question. But I think it's, a, and, and, you know, it gets, fantasy tends to get to the heart of the matter. You know, for being, dealing with unreal things, it really is about, at its heart, real things in ways that sometimes other forms of literature don't do. And, and Mark, haven't you always said that like Mark Twain, my dad was a moralist in disguise? Oh, absolutely. You know, I, there, I, I make a lot of parallel. If, if you haven't noticed the affection for Mark Twain, you know, it's kind of uh, in, in, in the face. Uh, but, you know, I think there's a lot of what Mark Twain did with humor is Rod Serling did with fantasy in the sense that they were both that that phrase that Anne was just referring to, moralist in disguise, that comes from a little girl in France who sent Mark Twain a fan letter. And in the fan letter, he was, this was in the last 10 years of life. And she sent him this note that said, um, I know everybody knows you as a funny man. Uh, but I, I sense that behind all of the joking, you're trying to say something very serious to us. And Mark Twain wrote back a letter to this amazing little girl in France that basically said, Shh, don't tell anybody. You've got it. You've got it exactly right. But don't tell anybody because I'm a moralist in disguise. And I don't know that there's a better description for Rod Serling than that phrase, is that Rod Serling was a moralist in disguise. He was using the, the Twilight Zone to get the message across and sneak it across. And I think that's, it will, we'll be talking about it. We're talking here, I mean, we're 60 years later. We're, we're talking about the twilights. We're still talking about the twilight zone. And 60 years from now, we will still be talking about it. Thank you. Uh, Andrew, you had a question about uh, the most recent um, twilight zone reboots. Uh, yes, about the reboots. Um, so Jordan Peele directed and narrated um, like, two-ish seasons of the reboot for the twilight zone so have either of you watched this reboot and what are your opinions on it and what are your opinions on there being a reboot well mark and i have discussed this at length i i'm biased mm -hmm. right from the starting gate mm -hmm. um, i and i actually didn't watch the uh first two reboots i think in the 80s and the 90s i did watch the first uh I think it may have been the first three episodes of the Jordan Peele one. We don't get CBS All Access, but we went to um, a friend's to watch. And honestly, I was not pleased. 
and and I'll and I'll say this about you know there have been a lot of things called the Twilight Zone since the Twilight Zone. Uh, there was a 1980s reboot. There was the movie in the 80s. There was a syndicated version, and now then now there's the Jordan Peele version. And uh, and I've watched all of them, and um, there is good and bad in all of them. There's some some really good moments in each each one, um, but it's hard to go home again. It's hard to go and recapture what the Twilight Zone. The Twilight Zone was so much a creation of those writers of that mindset and that time. It was so much what you know Rod Serling was doing with writers like Richard Matheson and Charles Beaumont. Um, that to try to go back and 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 do something, you might have it, look. You can do it an anthology show, a fantasy anthology show at any point at any time. But as soon as you call it the Twilight Zone, you are trying to compare it to this classic great show. You're chasing a ghost. You're never going to catch it. It's never going to happen. Better to, to come up with your own vision, like Rod Serling did, of a fantasy anthology show and pursue that. Under those guidelines, I actually think the real Twilight Zone for our era is a show called Black Mirror. Mm -hmm. I think it is, a, you know, and I think one of the reasons is because a guy by the name of Charlie Brooker, who does Black Mirror, came up with the idea. It was not the Twilight Zone. Uh, it was inspired by the Twilight Zone. And Charlie Brooker will tell anybody who asked him that he was inspired by the Twilight Zone. But it, if you watched Black Mirror, it's not the Twilight Zone. It is very much his vision of what it should be. Mm. So instead of trying to go back and recapture something and calling it the Twilight Zone, do your own anthology show. Mm. Do your own thing and call it that. And maybe you'll come up with the Twilight Zone for today. Yeah, Buck Houghton, the old producer, actually said of the reboots, it was missing a key element, and that was Rod Serling. And, and I'll go further with that and also missing the or the other original writers too, because it was a pretty seamless team. My dad wrote 92 of 156, but uh, the other writers' contributions were uh, just as stellar, actually. Thank you. Izzy, why don't you ask your question um, about inspiration in writing? So what would you say inspired you guys to write your books? based off of the Twilight Zone? Based off? What, uh, what inspired you to write your book based off of the Twilight Zone? Okay. Um, well, my book, actually, uh, I was, um, when my dad died, I was so paralyzed by grief that I, I, could barely move forward. And it took me actually decades to do that. I'd originally started a book called In His Absence, which I couldn't finish uh, precisely because I hadn't even begun to deal with the grief. But then when I finally wrote this memoir, it was in part uh, because I find writing cathartic like my dad did and, and like many people do. Uh, I wanted to know more about his professional work and my third reason was to put to rest some of the things that people had written about my dad, that he was this dark and tortured soul. And uh, he was the polar opposite of that. My, my father was so funny and a practical joker. And um, Mark, you said something earlier about how we're all little monkeys. And it, I, immediately I had the image of my father pretending to be a gorilla because he did the best gorilla um, impersonation you could you could imagine, but um, so those those are the reasons I wrote that book. And for me, um, you know, if I if I if if I truly answer this question, Izzy, we're going to be here the rest of the day, <laughs> okay? Uh, because um, I set out to write about the Twilight Zone uh, in the early 1980s. I thought I was, remember I said before about how writers never or, or rarely write about the next thing they're going to, to do? Well, you know, I was finishing my first book in 1981. Uh, it was published in 1982. And at that point, if you had asked me, what's your next book going to be? I would have told you, oh, I know what my next book's going to be. It's going to be about the Twilight Zone. That's my favorite series of all time. And why shouldn't I be the person to write that book? And 
Um, and I actually set out to, to do that. I was starting to do interviews and things like that. And then I had an experience that a lot of writers have. Of uh, I walked into a bookstore and there was the book I wanted to write. Somebody else had written it. <laughs> and it was this case, it was Mark Scott Sacre's The Twilight Zone Companion, which was a history of the series. And, uh, and I, I couldn't even get mad about it because Mark had done a really great job uh, on, on documenting the history of the series. I love that book. I still have that book. Uh, so, you know, I wrote a lot of other books after that. I wrote, you know, this book, this book, this book. And then um, in 2000, and I, I, I don't remember what year, but it was when my daughter turned 15, I decided to share The Twilight Zone with her. She'd seen Night Gallery, the other show that Rod had done. And uh, when she turned 15, she'd seen a lot of classic television. She liked classic television. So I said to her, at the 15, you know, you've completed your undergraduate work in television. It's time for you to start your graduate work. It's time for you to enter the Twilight Zone. So we did a, 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 a forced march through the entire run of the series, all 156 episodes in order. You know, and I started joking with her at the end of it was the episode. If I don't you may, you may know it, but there's an episode early in the run with David Wayne uh, where he plays a hypochondriac. And he called Walter named Walter Bedeker, and he's an unpleasant man. And the, 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 the devil appears and offers him immortality. And if, and if any of you know the Twilight Zone, you know you don't sign the contract. You know, you don't, uh, but when the episode was over, I jokingly turned to my daughter Becky and said, "Let that be a lesson to you. You know, always read contracts carefully. Don't do it. You know, we cut it. It was a joke, and we laughed and." Then it became a running joke. After every single episode, I would look at her and say, let that be a lesson to you. Let that be a lesson to you. And, you know, after a couple of weeks of this, not only did the joke get a little stale, but uh, the penny finally dropped in my head. And I went, well, this is the book. This is your Twilight Zone book. It, 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 I had to wait 30 years for it from when I was originally going to do it, uh, which is just a really good lesson about never give up on your passions, never give up on the things you love, never give up on the things you're interested in, because they will pay off like slot machines at some point in your life. You just don't know when and you don't know how. In this case, like I said, it took 30 years, but I got my Twilight Zone book. And and that would be true. I, I could go into that kind of detail on every book I've written. And, you know, they're, they're behind every single book. There's the same thing, which is passion, which is a love for a certain thing, you know, which which drives you to it. And that'll get you through a lot of writing a book because you got to love a book an awful lot yeah. to finish it. Because, you know, the every everybody has started a book. The whole the nation is full of computer files and filing cabinets full of books which were started because the first 5,000 words are the easiest things you ever write with a book. And then you realize you have to write maybe 80 to 90,000 words more. And you're going to hate that book an awful lot around 50,000 words. And the only thing that's going to get you through it is love. The only thing that's going to get you through it is the passion that you have for it. I tend to be long-winded in my answers. Your Both of your answers have been great, and we truly, really appreciate it. I do want to put a cap on this so you can go about your days. Is there anything that hasn't been asked? Daniel, you came in a little late. If you have anything you want to ask, now's a, a chance to unmute and say hello. Yes, I got a question. Um, my question is to answer, Ling. Um, what is your favorite episode with... And also, what is your father's favorite episode? Hi, Daniel. Um, uh, walking distance. Um, although, like Mark said, his answer changes whatever day you ask. And I think my dad's probably changed as well. I, I also mentioned uh, in uh, Death's Head Revisited. Mm. Um, Mark had mentioned... Um, uh, the Monsters Who Do on Maple Street. Uh, one of my favorite episodes is also in Praise of Pip. Have you guys seen that one? Uh, in, in that yeah, episode. Yeah, I've watched all of them, I think. <laughs> yeah, in that episode. And I didn't actually watch a lot of the Twilight Zones when my dad was still alive. I started to watch them after he died. And it was initially more to see him than, than the show. 
uh, but in Praise of Pip was one of the first ones I watched and I was stunned to see that my dad used some of the dialogue he and I used, who's your best buddy, you are. So I, I literally kind of found my dad uh, in the Twilight Zone again. Hey, Brian? Yes. Can I ask a question? Oh, absolutely. Um, well, I'm curious. Uh, you know, we, we have we have five of you here, and you know, you learn from your students if you're smart. What's your favorite episodes? Izzy, what's your favorite episode? I think mine would either be a stop at Willoughby or um, the After Hours. Oh, good choices, Nick. Do you have a favorite? Um, uh, to be honest, I think my favorite would be the pilot because it introduces you into how amazing the uh, Twilight Zone is. So, so for you, for you, it's where is everybody? Uh, mm -hmm. Okay, Andrew. Yeah, this is a hard choice. Like, I haven't seen nearly enough episodes as I really want to. Like, I really want to go through and see every single episode. But probably my favorite is actually the one I saw the absolute most recently, like yesterday, To Serve Man. Because, yeah. I mean, it's probably not, like, the greatest in saying, like, you know, plot-wise. But I think every single episode has a really good twist in it. And I think that one just had the biggest plot twist in it, and that's just why I love it a lot. Okay. Daniel, do you have one? Um, I'm going to have to go with the same with Izzy. <laughs> yeah. we, we watched the the uh, episodes that Izzy mentioned. We've, we've probably watched five to seven as a group, and that's fresh in their minds, for sure. Well, Brian, you haven't answered the question yet. I I have a hard time answering it. But I've loved the show so long. Time enough at last is is what I think of when I think of the Twilight Zone, and and I think the way it attacks the love of literature is so offensive and obscene that I I just feel bad for the guy in the episode. Let the man read, and, <laughs> and I I think that's just such a classic. Can I, episode. Can I say something on that actually? Yeah. Um, uh, I think the good thing about the Twilight Zone is how. You didn't, it's like the ending is not what you wanted, which makes it good. For example, in Time Enough at Last, you don't want his glasses to break. You don't want that to happen. But I think that's what just makes the episodes in the show so good. Well said, Izzy. Yeah. Um, that was a great question. And I have a hard time answering that just because I do love this, this show so, so much. I bet that Time Enough at Last and Monsters get mentioned all of the time. Um, as far as these questions go. Is, is there anything else that anybody wants to add? Well, I, I would uh, just like to thank you all because um, clearly you guys are so bright and um, you, you offer so much encouragement to the future. And I don't mean to sound like a Miss America thing, but it's, it's refreshing to, to hear you. It's, um, it gives me hope. It gives me hope. and. Um, so thank you. Thank you. Th these young people give me hope every single day. I, I was listening to a podcast um, that Mark did rec recently. I, he mentioned that curiosity is the thing that he would give to every young person. Mm -hmm. these, these are curious young people. And because of them, I think we will make it past all of the plagues that we experience as, as humans, truly. Yeah, you know, this actually touches something I told my students at Kansas State just last week. Um, which is, uh, you know, I, I, people my age, um, they love, they just love casting off on the, quote, millennials. You've probably already heard this, you know, is, is you know, everybody thinks they know you. They don't know you. They don't, they have no idea who you are. But, you know, your future employers out there are all ready to sort of look at you monolithically and can say, you know, like, oh, well, the millennials are this, they're that, there's a, you know, and, you know, you're none of the things that they say you are. And one of the greatest things that you are and they don't understand is that your generation, and this is why I think it, it, there's a lot of hope for the future, you don't have the baggage that we have. You don't have, you're not carrying a lot of the prejudices and the 
the the emotional baggage that a lot of the the people who are ready to cast off on you have and i'd rather see that than anything almost anything else that's an amazing um, uh you know uh, that's an amazing thing to have in your equipment as you move forward is not to have those those snap judgments of people and being more open and receptive to things you know I think that's that that's and I've seen that I've seen that with you know I've been teaching at Kent State since 2009 and that aspect only keeps getting better and better and I think that's you know you guys have a secret and it's it and and the secret is that you know you're not you're not as hung up on things as the generation in front of you and I think that if there's if there is really reason to hope that's it that's it no, I'll take a good heart over anything else. Thank you. We truly appreciate it. And, and best of luck to both of you. And we certainly will continue to be fans and adore everything that, that the Twilight Zone represents. And I will do my best for all young people with Shay Learning in middle school. So thank you so much. We appreciate it. Thank you, all of you. Thank you. Have, have a great day. I'm going to stop the recording now.